Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining in this new Institute for Global Health Sciences COVID series presentation. Today, we have a very important topic, and we have two fabulous speakers. The topic is one that has been pretty much neglected in the public discourse, and that is the situation of COVID in incarcerated people. And for that, we have two fabulous uh, speakers. Thank you to Dr. Bree Williams and Dr. Stefano Bertossi for joining us. Dr. Bree Williams is uh, a professor of medicine at UCSF. She directs uh, the program in partnership with the, the Norwegians called AMEND, and she will be talking more about that. Um, she has been working on uh, correctional facilities and proposing innovative solutions for quite a long time. Stefano Bertossi is uh, Dean Emeritus and, and Professor of Health Policy and Management at uh, Berkeley. He has worked everywhere um, with uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, with the Mexican Institute of Public Health, UNH, WHO, the World Bank, the um, DC, DRC. So he has extensive experience as a health economist and has been also uh, visiting uh, prisons for, uh, since I remember uh, when he was working in, in, in Mexico. So, um, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Williams to uh, lead this conversation and uh, I will hand the floor to you. Thank you, Bree. Thank you so much uh, for having us here and Steph is going to share our slides. Thank you. Well, it is an absolute pleasure to be here today and to be invited uh, to speak with you uh, about prison health during COVID-19 and some of the lessons our team has learned. Next slide. A little bit about us. Um, as you mentioned, I am from uh, the founding director of AMEND at UCSF, which is a prison culture change program that draws on the principles of public health and human rights to bring transformative change to incarceration in the US. And we work in partnership with the Norwegian Correctional Service. And during the pandemic, faculty from AMEND at UCSF and faculty from UC Berkeley launched CalProtect which stands for the California Prison Roadmap for targeting efforts to address the ecosystem of COVID transmission. And this was really launched to provide thought partnership and health care expertise to correctional facilities in California and really globally. Next. This is important because as of yesterday, 390,000 uh, people incarcerated in US prisons alone had COVID-19, had a diagnosis of COVID-19, about 2,400 have died. About 95,000 staff have been reported to have COVID-19 and about 4,000 have died. And these are certainly underestimations as many prison systems do not publicly report their cases or deaths. Next slide. One of the first prisons uh, that CalProtect visited during COVID-19 was San Quentin, just across the bridge here in the East Bay. On May 30th, about 120 individuals were moved by bus to San Quentin from a prison in Southern California that had a COVID-19 outbreak, essentially for their safety. Unfortunately, by June 12th, there were 16 cases at San Quentin. And on June 13th, CalProtect, again, faculty from AMEND and, UCSF, and UC Berkeley visited and issued urgent recommendations. I'm gonna hand it over to Steph now, who's gonna describe some of what our team learned during our prison visits over the last several months. And this will be followed by a description of seven overarching lessons that we've taken from these months and some next steps in this work. Thank you. Thanks, Bree, and thanks, Jaime, for inviting us. It's really a pleasure to be here with you. I, um, I wanna give you a little bit of an impression of what it was like on the 13th of June to walk into San Quentin and in particular to Badger Block. I don't think this is a picture of Badger Block, but it's very similar to what Badger Block looked like. Badger Block was the cell block into which the inmates were moved when they came from Southern California. And 
When you walk in here, this is a building that was built in the 1920s. Uh, San Quentin dates from the 1850s, but this particular type of cell block was built in the 1920s. If you see here, you'll see that there are five tiers, one on top of the other, one, two, three, four, five. And the tiers are not against the windows. So the windows are on the outside, and these tiers are on the inside, and they're back to back with the, with the mirror image tier on the other side. So if you will, there's this peninsula in the middle of cells surrounded by a common airspace. And what, the reason I chose this picture was because you can see what the cells are. The cells are what you imagine from old time movies, where the front wall of the cell, the door and the wall next to it are all bars. So while the 120 were moved into this cell block from Southern California, where they were in dorms, where it was felt that that was too dangerous for these high risk prisoners, they were being moved to San Quentin because San Quentin had celled housing available. But what you can see here is that for a respiratory pathogen, this isn't celled housing that is safe. This is really, this single building is essentially a dorm of 750 men in these open cells, all breathing the same airspace. And so when we walked in there, not only everybody was not out of their cells like the people are now, they were on lockdown because of COVID. So they were all in their cells and the only way for them to speak to us was to scream at us. So we had people from, you know, four tiers up yelling down what they thought about the situation and how unhappy they were that people from Southern California where there was COVID had been moved into San Quentin where there was no COVID. They were angry and as they were screaming, all I could think about was how much they were aerosolizing into this common airspace. And unfortunately, our worst case scenario came to pass and there was an explosive outbreak. This graph here shows you California at the bottom in blue. It shows you the overall prison system in orange and it shows you then what happened in San Quentin in uh, the beginning of June with this introduction. Now, more recently, we've been to see a very different prison. So this is a satellite view of the substance abuse treatment facility in Corcoran, California. It's called Substance Abuse Treatment Facility, but it's really just a prison like any other. And you can see it's a huge complex. You've got all these different yards labeled A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, and they are really mini prisons within a prison. Even this complex here, which is one complex with a single entryway, is actually two completely separate yards, which uh, the populations of those two yards cannot mix at all. And they're very different building types because one of the things Brie taught me when I first started working with her is, Steph, when you've seen one prison, you've seen one prison. And what I'm gonna show you here is one of these. So I'm gonna show you A and D just because they are so different from each other. They may not look that different from the satellite, but this is what the inside of the buildings on A yard look like. This is one third of one of these buildings. You can see the diagram down here at the bottom. What we're looking at is this space in the building. And you're, you're seeing on the floor plan, it's just one floor, but you can see there are two floors, one on top of the other, where there are, this Sorry, is one- Sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. This is one big dorm with um, Siri trying to interfere. <laughs> one big dorm and there are, these are designed for 12 men each on six bunk beds. After COVID, um, the pandemic started, they were reduced to eight. So when we visited, there were eight people in each of these little mini sleeping areas, all in one big dorm. And what you can't see in this picture is that from this big dorm to the next big dorm, you can see down here, there's a big opening. So as you can imagine, this is not 750 men, but it's 150 men sharing the same airspace. And in this case right here, this is 48 men sharing one airspace with a grate into the next space. Now, on that same complex, D is completely different, okay? So this is the D yard buildings. It's one building which has a ring of 100 cells um, split into 50 on the top and 50 on the bottom. So you can see here it's a C, and what you're looking at here is just um, part of one of the side walls and part of the center wall of cells. You can see here, well, let me just go back for one second. I just wanna point out <clears throat> what you see here in terms of ventilation. You see here air intakes on the ceiling and small windows on the back of these dorms that are sealed and do not open. This facility was built in the mid 1990s. 
this building is also air vents in the ceiling introducing air but here one or two prisoners are in a a, a cell and that cell is has a window which is sealed on the back side but the doors and walls are solid completely unlike san quentin what you see here is the grave that's the shower in the middle so completely different now you would imagine from what we said in the summertime was that the prison system needed to be most concerned about residents who were housed in dorms because of the potential for the kind of explosive spread we saw in san quentin we expected therefore getting to Sadaf, that this was similarly dangerous to san quentin just a little bit smaller but this should be much safer and we we spoke of hierarchy of of risk levels so here's what happened at Sadaf, uh, this prison so one thing we did when we went to visit is that this time we took rachel sklar with us a, a recent doctoral graduate from berkeley who measured co2 levels and estimated air changes per hour and you can see here that in the dorms there were only 0.7 air changes per hour and down here in d there was almost six air changes per hour in one of the cells so that would reinforce the idea that this is a safer airspace um, and a safer place to be more air changes per hour fewer people in a cell and individually housed or housed with one other resident what happened so these are the um, the epidemic curves for different housing units at SADF. You can see here that in early September, there was a pretty explosive outbreak in B, which is dorm type housing, just like A. So those, those were the dorms with 48 people each, three of those in a building connected. But look, at the end of October, there was an absolutely explosive outbreak in D. D is the one down here with the individual cells. So that's not what we expected. And what we came to realize was that there were potentially two important things contributing to that explosive spread. One of them is that what happened between June and November, what happened was the weather got cold, the heat was turned on, and what was previously a system that was drawing in outside air and exhausting the inside air because they were using swamp coolers to cool the air and swamp coolers cool by evaporating air so you need to exchange the air that you're cooling they switched over to heat and turned on recirculation so that the air exhausted from the cell block was put through a heater through low level MERV filters and reintroduced back into the facility now that was at the same time that there was an out that there were obviously a surge in the community with many more introductions from guards and we now know the likelihood that those that the variants circulating at the end of the year were more likely were more transmissible than those circulating at the beginning of the year so what that created was this catastrophic situation where even in this single celled housing you see here that it very quickly rose to over 600 men in that yard infected Now, just to remind you that when you've seen one prison, you've seen one prison. The most recent prison <clears throat> that uh, we visited was the Correctional Training Facility down in Soledad. This prison was built in the early 1950s, and it looks quite similar to the one I just showed you. Individual cells, doors, solid walls, solid doors, but there's a big difference. Each one of these cells has a window that opens, and the central area has these clear story windows, which are fully open on both sides, leading to cross ventilation. And the heating is not from forced air that's recirculated, but rather hydronic heat that warms the walls of these cells. So very different physical environments that certainly are linked to the different levels of risk we see. And that's the, the project that we have is really trying to better understand the link between the physical environment and the virus and <clears throat> the, pe the people housed in those environments. And so with that, I'll just mention our, our findings when we left San Quentin was that we had antiquated facilities, we had poor ventilation. I showed you before that there were windows all around these cell blocks. What I didn't tell you was that all those windows were welded shut a number of years ago, probably when they installed the fire extraction system. <clears throat> there was limited staff testing. There was no limitation on movement 
from one housing unit to the other because of the union contract, which meant that the, the officers working on the units with infected uh, residents could also then do overtime on a different uh, unit and very delayed testing turnaround so that they were getting their results back on the tests that they were doing after most people were no longer infectious. So with that, let me turn it back to Brie and I'm gonna stop sharing and Brie, you can share your screen. You're muted, Brie. Of course. Our urgent recommendations uh, have turned into seven urgent lessons that we'd like to share with you now. The first and most critical is decarcerate. There's another picture of uh, another prison system in, uh, in California, really showing you how incredibly overcrowded these facilities are. Many incarcerated people are in poor health. They're living in incredibly overcrowded environments and more than 170,000 incarcerated Americans uh, in prisons are older adults, mean over the age of 55 and high risk for COVID-19 uh, consequences. So the most single most critical intervention that we've identified is public health focused decarceration. National Academy of Sciences put out a similar recommendation uh, this past summer. You know, the foundational principles of mitigation are physically distanced to quarantine exposures, to test, to isolate cases, and none of these things can be accomplished without space. Obviously, minimizing the numbers in congregate living facilities can decrease risk of infection to those who are released, but it can also increase health resources, which are limited for those who remain. Our second lesson is to use medical isolation and quarantine in an ethical manner, not in a manner that is similar to solitary confinement. So I'm gonna take a second to explain to you what solitary confinement is. It's also called the whole ADSEG or administrative segregation or restrictive housing. It is uh, the housing situation where people are left for 22 hours a day, seven days a week in a cell roughly the size of a parking spot. They eat, sleep and defecate in that same room. They have minimal access to showers and exercise. They have limited or no contact with loved ones. And this is used extremely commonly in US prisons even before COVID. So what does this have to do with COVID-19? Well, the problem uh, I think was put really well by this uh, person who had a Twitter account in prison during COVID-19. He wrote, many were sent to solitary confinement for being sick with COVID-19. My friend finally got out after 45 days of being in a cage alone. I started counting on how many words I spoke in a day. He told me one day I spoke only six words to myself. And what we see is that fear of solitary confinement appropriately has been a major roadblock in the fight to contain COVID-19 in prisons really across the globe. People who are exposed or infected obviously cannot be in close proximity to others or COVID-19 will spread, but fear of isolation and solitary confinement has deterred patients from reporting symptoms and that's led to worsening COVID-19 outbreaks in correctional facilities. Obviously also the use of punitive isolation for anyone, but especially for someone who's sick also contravenes medical ethics. So what are the elements of ethical use of quarantine and medical isolation in correctional facilities? And you know, the first most important thing is to ask, well, what is quarantine? And again, this is the practice of separating a person who's often asymptomatic, who is exposed to or is expected to have a contagious disease until we know whether or not they're gonna have it. So basically their status is unknown and they have to be separated until their status is known. And this requires space. Medical isolation, is the practice of separating a person who has a confirmed or highly suspected contagious disease until they're no longer contagious. But there's no problem housing people who have COVID-19 together. They're isolated from the general population, but they can be together, they can exercise together, as long as the other people that they're with have a laboratory confirmed diagnosis of COVID-19. But of course, this also requires space. So in what ways should medical isolation and quarantine be the same as solitary confinement? And the answer is really just one, that people are separated from the general population. All of the uh, punitive aspects of solitary confinement really should not, well, we can argue that they should never be in place, but they should certainly not be in place for a medical intervention. So some of the examples of conditions that are needed for ethical use of these uh, housing situations or care and conditions should be overseen by medical, not custody staff. 
People should receive daily visits from healthcare and mental health staff. There should be clear and daily communication about the duration of medical isolation, the rationale for why they're there and how long they're gonna be there from healthcare staff. They should have opportunities to go outside and exercise. They should have enhanced access to television, tablets, radio, reading materials, and free and accessible means for communicating with loved ones. So what steps can ensure the ethical use of quarantine and medical isolation in prison? The answer is again, there's a theme, decarcerate. To express gratitude, you know, asymptomatic people with exposure or people with mild symptoms are doing a public service in prisons by reporting to staff that they have symptoms and agreeing to be isolated. So we need to incentivize them and, and thank them and communicate. I mean, it's incredibly important to engage so-called inmate or family advisory councils to identify communication strategies, concerns, meaningful incentives to show people that uh, these housing situations are meaningfully different than solitary confinement. The third lesson is to op optimize occupational health. So COVID-19 really reminds us that our health is interconnected. Staff bring infection back and forth from community work and work to the community. Sorry, my dog. Staff and residents should also both be amongst the highest priority groups for vaccination, which has been the case in California, but not in many states around the nation. In a, uh, interviews and in a um, survey with 1400 correctional staff across 45 states right in the beginning of COVID-19, we found that many co correctional staff have multiple chronic health conditions. They work in incredibly overcrowded workplaces, just like people live in incredibly uh, overcrowded prisons. They said things like, we, we no longer call ourselves essential, now we say we're sacrificial since COVID-19 has begun or I'm my mother and father's ride for appointments and shopping. I need to be healthy. Yes, I know I signed up for this job, but none of us saw this coming. It's scary as hell. So there are a number of ways that we can improve correctional occupational health during COVID-19, weekly testing in hotspots with high community transition or in prisons with outbreaks, providing obviously access to and training and PPE, incredibly important, especially at the outset of the pandemic last year. Organizing staff and residents into cohorts, again, so that people are both physically distancing, but again, as Steph was saying, not going back and forth to different prisons, bringing potentially contagion with them. Instituting culture of health policies, so encouraging sick leave use, but also telling people that they can use sick leave if they have been exposed, if they're tired after a day of vaccination or feeling sick after a day of vaccination, and giving people like COVID sick days so it doesn't it doesn't go into their vacation time or unpaid leave. Having consequences for not practicing universal masking, providing temporary staff hoteling and housing. So a lot of times in the beginning of the pandemic, especially uh, hospital systems were giving temporary hoteling and housing for healthcare staff, but not for correctional officers. And so they were going home and potentially exposing family members. And then of course, again, priority access to vaccination, but also access to people who could answer their questions about vaccination. The fourth is to create a centralized outbreak response team. And so the goal is really that every prison shouldn't have to create their solutions de novo each time there's a massive outbreak. That from the central um, unit, the state, basically the state system, there should be an environment of care uh, physician. So this would be somebody who focuses on ventilation, sanitation, the flow of people throughout the daily routine, cohorting staff and people who are incarcerated. There should be somebody in charge of healthcare custody coordination. So that's somebody who partners with custody to access on a daily basis the housing of residents for medical isolation and quarantine, assessing that they're in the right place and making sure that medical leadership is really running that housing plan. Somebody in charge of COVID-19 testing, who's coordinating the testing, ensuring rapid testing turnaround time, making sure that tests are not lingering, that people are not waiting kind of without the test. Um, and an epidemiologic analyst who's essentially reviewing all the active and resolved cases again, to make sure that people are in the right place at the right time with the right testing. The fifth lesson is to clarify the rights of incarcerated seriously ill patients who are transferred from com to community hospitals. And really at a very basic minimum, uh, there are some very clear ethical standards for the care of incarcerated patients in community hospitals. Most importantly, people retain the right to self-determination. They have the ability to choose what medical interventions they do or do not want. 
in the hospital. They retain the right to name a proxy. So they should be able to name a family member or a friend as a medical proxy decision maker in the event that they get so sick, they can't make a decision for themselves or don't want to. And it's really important here to underscore that like the warden does not make medical decisions for the person or even the prison doctor does not make medical decisions. That should be their family member. Their family member should be kept apprised of their medical conditions so that they can do so. And finally, communication. Everybody should have the right, and in the federal system, it's actually a protected right to say goodbye to loved ones at the end of their life, obviously during COVID through video conferencing call or phone call. But what we found is that community healthcare professionals are often extremely unsure about the rights of seriously ill patients who are transferred in from prisons. Our team uh, worked with the Department of Corrections in California uh, to create sort of a cheat sheet for how to provide acute care to seriously ill incarcerated patients, just making sure that community healthcare professionals know what the standards are. We were finding that people who are uh, in community hospitals were having their rights almost trampled on more than they would have been uh, if the prison system was saying what their healthcare rights should be because professionals just didn't know what they were allowed to have. And that's available on our website. The sixth of seven lessons is to partner with residents and their loved ones to identify meaningful solutions. It's amazing that I actually have to put this up as a lesson, but, but it is often overlooked and forgotten. So why is a more humanistic and kind of partnership approach to corrections particularly important during COVID-19? And I think that this was really well said by a colleague of mine, uh, Leanne Birch, who ran the Department of Corrections in North Dakota for many years. She said, North Dakota's prison residents are the Department of Corrections partners in our effort to keep our facilities safe. They're doing extra cleaning, maintaining social distancing as much as possible in a congregate housing situation and sharing their ideas on how to maintain a calm environment. And in a time of crisis, when there's heightened fear among all of us, North Dakota's prison staff continues to receive actually letters of appreciation for keeping people well-informed, being caring um, and patient during this very stressful time. And we found even uh, just as important is really community partnership. And so we have, uh, were asked to work with a number of uh, different partners. These are some of them, uh, there are many others to create kind of an academic community healthcare uh, partnership around vaccine frequently asked questions um, to specifically identify the questions and answer the questions of people who are incarcerated. Um, and we've done that and really moved that uh, vaccine FAQ throughout the nation. And the final is the importance of sharing knowledge and learning from each other. Um, this is a Zoom picture of what we've been calling COVID conversations. And these are a series of conversations that where we're bringing correctional officers together from one state with another state or from one nation to another nation. This one is uh, between Norwegian and US correctional staff, really just to discuss what's working, what's not working. It's very easy to forget about the people who are living in prisons. It's also easy to forget about the people who are working in prisons and for people who are working in prisons to feel completely isolated from the rest of the world and giving them an opportunity to meet on friendly common areas of understanding and stress and reinforcing kind of occupational ideas and support humanity and dignity driven responses to COVID-19 has been really helpful. I'm gonna turn it back over uh, to Steph who's gonna speak a little bit about next steps. Thanks, Bree. Um, you want me to share? Um, or I can. That. Nope, that's okay. Oops, I'm, I'm right okay. there. Happy to do so. Um, just. So I just wanted to kick off our discussion um, with a couple ideas about what it is that we're working on and what it is that we'd like to work on and, and encourage any of you who are interested in collaborating with us to. Uh, to raise your hands or find time with us uh, after this session. But one really interesting thing is the epidemiology of spread within the prison. I mentioned before how what we thought was true in June wasn't true anymore in November when we saw explosive spread in what we thought were safer units. What that meant, of course, was that we couldn't use those units safely for quarantine because if you couldn't protect somebody in a cell from um, who was being quarantined and who was not infected from somebody four cells down who was quarantined and infected. So we have data now um, increasingly from the system about 
who was where when, when they became uh, infected, uh, what sorts of air exchange is present in those facilities when the heating system was turned on, et cetera. And we're working with a team at uh, the Proctor Foundation and also at UC Berkeley and Stanford and others who are modeling uh, the spread within different kinds of housing units at different parts of the year. Uh, similarly, we have very complete information about clinical evolution and the correlates thereof. So because everybody in prison is being tested for months now, we have much more complete testing. We know who is not infected. We know who is asymptomatic. We know who's mildly symptomatic. We know who's severely symptomatic. And we also have the ability to link all of that to system-wide electronic medical records that uh, provide population-wide documentation of underlying comorbid conditions. Not just whether they have diabetes, but how well controlled their diabetes is or their hypertension or what their BMI is over time, et cetera. And very interestingly now that we've had more than 45,000 residents of our prison system infected, we can track longer term sequelae of asymptomatic and symptomatic cases among uh, a total population of over 90,000. Now, the other thing that I'll mention, which is I think really interesting is that we're all, of course, worried about the new variants. We're worried about whether we will have breakthrough variants that escape both natural immunity acquired from natural infection or vaccine-induced immunity. And in the prison system, we have the ability to monitor people who were previously infected because we know um, which people were previously infected much more than we do in the community. And of course, we also can monitor people who are now being vaccinated and we can characterize those breakthrough viruses. And we've encouraged the system to keep the samples from any of these breakthrough infections, whether it's in a previously infected person or a previously vaccinated person, because that will be especially high likelihood viruses to be uh, different variants. And um, um, this is our CalProtect team at both UCSF and Berkeley. Obviously it's not just the two of us. In fact, most of the work is not the two of us. So we're very grateful to all of them, including um, a team which is represented here by Amy Lerman from the Goldman School of Public Policy, which is doing a bunch of the qualitative work. Here you see also some of our, of our um, uh, modelers from, from the um, Proctor Foundation. And these are our, our contacts. I'll come back to this slide, but I just pasted in a picture because Bree mentioned repeatedly decarceration. But this picture really helps you understand why we feel so strongly about this. Most people don't realize that we have nursing homes in our prison system. Most people don't realize that we have entire dorms full of people, um, wheelchairs, walkers, um, crutches, who need skilled, skilled nursing care. You can't enter a, a, a dorm like this and think to yourself, what kind of a country would keep these people incarcerated in a dorm setting where you can't control the spread of a respiratory infection in the middle of a pandemic. So any of you who have um, uh, the ability to speak to the powers that be, um, I'd encourage you to think about this picture and consider the fact that even if some of these men for, for whatever reason need to come back to prison and finish serving out their sentence, they don't need to do it during a pandemic. And with that, I'll pull it back on the uh, and, and turn it over uh, um, to Q&A. So I think, Kemi, you're gonna take us forward, right? Yes, for sure, thank you. And uh, Steph, if you don't mind um, uh, unsharing your screen. So Absolutely. Great, thank you. And then uh, Jaime, do you uh, have any questions, any follow-up questions before I jump in? I, I do, and... Uh... I have uh, a comment first, uh, expressing uh, my admiration to Dr. Williams and Bertossi for doing this kind of uh, work and making the invisible visible. Um, I, I just don't think many people know and understand the conditions uh, incarcerated people are going through, particularly in this pandemic. So I, I really applaud the courage and commitment to make this uh, visible and uh, 
putting this uh, on the agenda, on the political agenda, I should say. Um, I found the, the conditions uh, shocking. Steph mentioned that when you have seen one prison, you, can, you have only seen one prison. And uh, I, I had no idea there would be such huge variations in the design uh, of, the, of the prisons. Uh, so I'm so happy to learn that uh, Dr. Williams is partnering with the Norwegians in the AMEND project, because clearly we have a lot to learn from the Scandinavians in terms of um, facilities, but also about the training of uh, the staff and uh, the attitudes uh, towards prisoners, uh, which I think is so needed. I, I just fail to understand why this country has incarcerated so many people uh, needlessly. Um, so I'm impressed also, Steph, with the investigation you guys did on, on how uh, in, in the differences between block A and D and how uh, different uh, the expectations were with uh, respect to the reality. So I hope that uh, uh, investigation is uh, polished somewhere because I think uh, it uh, shows um, um, a lot and can be used to prevent other outbreaks uh, elsewhere. Um, I have one difficult question for both of you. I have heard from some people saying, and, and just to make it very, very clear, that is absolutely not my position, but I have heard people saying, oh, it's unfair to uh, vaccinate prisoners first, uh, as opposed to other vulnerable people outside of the prisons. Um, what is the best response to that? And um, how to persuade people that absolutely incarcerated people are a huge priority uh, to get vaccinated. So um, just to start the conversation with some comments on this particular question. Do you want to take that? I, I, th I think you should go first and I'm, I, I will pile on. <laughs> Or do you want me to? You go I'm just it. looking at the Q and A, and there are just some wonderful questions as well. I would say, I mean, the most uh, there's uh, the human rights aspect uh, answer to your question, and then there's the practical public health answer to your question. You know, the human rights knee jerk response is yes, people went to court, they got punished, they went to prison for that punishment, and they were never sentenced to COVID. So, you know, the first answer is. It, it has nothing to, whether or not they get vaccinated has nothing to do with their sentence and where they are, except to say that they're in a high risk situation because they're in communal living. And that's the end of story as far as I'm concerned from a public health perspective. But in terms of the practical public health perspective, I, mean, I think we can go even further. Hundreds of thousands of correctional staff are entering and exiting these facilities every day, oftentimes multiple times a day. So whether or not you buy the human rights response, which I think should be enough, frankly, um, to why people who are incarcerated and staff members in correctional facilities should be among the highest uh, you know, priority uh, for vaccination, the fact is that you are absolutely not gonna be able to, um, to contain COVID-19 if, if you don't vaccinate. And you know, where are the most likely opportunities for uh, the development of variants. It's in places with 2,000, 3,000 people infected at the same time, kind of moving around the virus in a very small enclosed space. I mean, you know, honestly, I mean, to use a scientific term, it's just plain stupid not to. She said what I was gonna say. <laughs> Okay, great. With that, I'll just jump into um, some of these questions that um, we have here. So the uh, first question I'm going to ask this for both of you is surveillance testing currently in place across California prisons? Um, I guess I can answer this one. Um, maybe we'll flip it back and forth. Um, absolutely. 
Um, it didn't start as aggressively as we um, would have hoped. Um, and only two prisons are doing sewage surveillance, which has been done in cooperation with the University of California uh, in two of the prisons, San Quentin and the California Medical Facility. So I, I think it would be useful to accelerate that and start doing sewage testing across all the prisons because what they showed at the California Medical Facility was that it gave them a heads up a couple of days before they detected cases in the cell blocks. Um, but right now, because of the surge that happened in, at the end of the year, there's been weekly testing across the system. And one of the things that actually we've been discussing with, with the system is the balance between frequency of testing versus speed of getting the results back. So as you can imagine, you can do daily testing, but if it takes you a week to get the results back, you've missed the infectious period and you're not able to prevent ongoing infections from the person that you've diagnosed as being infected. So one of the things that's interesting is they're increasing their rapid testing capacity within the prison. And I think over time, they will be shifting to more rapid testing and comparatively less external PCR testing. Um, but yes, there is extensive testing happening, which is why I mentioned before, it's such a great research environment because we know who's getting infected. And one other thing to mention is that refusal rates on testing dropped dramatically once they stopped using the nasopharyngeal swab and using the anterior um, nasal swab because of course the other one is much more uncomfortable. Got it. And, and speaking of refusals, are there efforts to increase vaccination acceptance among California prison staff and inmates and by whom? So Bree, why don't you take that one? Cause you've done a great job. Sorry, can you rep repeat it one more time? As yeah, sure. More <laughs> For sure. Are there efforts to increase vaccination acceptance among California uh, prison staff and inmates and by whom? Um, so different answers to that question, uh, but both are yes. Um, I think that the most incredible push um, really to, you know, the tone with residents is to bring people knowledge that they can trust and the community and community activists and people who are formerly incarcerated or who have family members who are currently incarcerated are leading that effort in an extraordinary way. Um, I would call out the work of Restore Justice, um, of the Ella Baker Center, um, of Roots and Rebound. There's, I mean, I can't even, there's, the list goes on and on. Um, but, but really the, the goal is to bring people information that they feel like they can trust so that they can make a decision that is right for themselves. We hope it's vaccination, but the most important thing is to give people the knowledge so that they have the power to be able to make the right choice. Um, the, so I would say the community is leading the efforts. Equally matched, I believe, is the prison system, which is doing everything that they can, or, well, I, I'll say from the outside, I feel like they've done an incredible job working with uh, independent filmmakers, um, bringing community uh, activists inside, community leaders inside to try to speak with uh, people who are incarcerated. We've been working as hard as we can to develop, you know, one thing that we were told is like there was no medical professional group kind of putting in external information. That's why we've made that vaccine FAQ. It's in English and Spanish. Um, it's on our website. It's been disseminated throughout the nation. We actually are just in the process of updating it to add the J&J &J vaccine information as well. So that one will be out on Monday and then the Spanish one one week later. Um, so those are some of the efforts for the, for the residents. And then um, I would also say that there are correctional healthcare professionals inside prisons, some of whom are trained at UCSF and at UC Berkeley who are ex extraordinary and are there to provide care to people who are really the most disenfranchised patients uh, in our nation. And they are working incredibly hard with, uh, you know, with trying to work with their patients. So there's a lot of different efforts. And in some prisons, we're seeing acceptance rates in the 85 to 90% range. Um, in terms of officers, um, there's a lot of work through the officer union and really Amy Lerman and her group at the People Lab um, at the Goldman School of Public Policy at UC Berkeley are really leading at least our team's efforts to understand what people need. We also created um, kind of a fireside chat interview with a couple physicians on our team and a couple of correctional officers who sort of pooled all the questions from their friends and colleagues and asked um, us 
about the vaccine. And so I think, and we're trying to disseminate that sort of fireside chat around. So really, I think that the answer to this is the more people who are involved who are just trying to get answers to people who have questions in ways that they can accept and read and, and hear about their answers, um, about their questions being answered, the better. Um, but I think that the, at least in California, that has been a very big push. And I think Drew wrote at the bottom here that uh, California is really one of the few states that has been prioritizing officers and residents in their prisons. So actually we're, at, we're doing pretty well in that regard in California. And we're seeing plummeting rates of infections as a that, which is really good news. I mean, I, I, I really applaud the fact that the state has prioritized the prisons for, for vaccination. It keeps the prison safe. It keeps the communities that the prisons are in safe. Um, Let me take a, a couple of questions from the audience uh, that are kind of similar. Um, one is, uh, do you think that COVID will be a catalyst for more humane conditions in prisons in the US? And uh, the second is, um, in what ways do you foresee racial stratification happening in the, the incarceration process? And uh, what can localities do about this? You want to start, Bree, or do you want me to start? Uh, you can start, and I'll jump in. Um, well, uh, Rafiq's question about racial stratification, I think, um, goes to decarceration, but obviously to so much more. Um, one, just to mention that um, Bree mentioned the acceptance rates of vaccination in the prisons is at the last prison I visited was about 80% as compared to about 50% among the staff. And um, yet what we hear in the community, of course, is that people of color are more resistant to vaccination than Caucasian Americans. And um, if you look at the prison system, you'll see that a far higher proportion of, of residents are people of color than is true of the staff. So we don't see what is commonly reported in the press being played out in terms of vaccine acceptance. Now, when it comes to release, um, there's all kinds of things at play. One has to do with the ability of a prison resident to advocate for their decarceration whether for medical reasons or other things. And obviously that has to do with their level of community support, lawyers, et cetera. So I, I am worried about the degree of, of uh, differential decarceration, um, but I also worry about it because one of the things that impedes decarceration is the ability to welcome that person into a supportive community. And that may also be different for different subpopulations within the prison. The, um, the, other, now they, they flew by me, so, oh, I see, they were, they've been in the answered, um, they've gone into the answered. So the other one, um, Brie, why don't you tackle the issue of catalyst for more humane conditions? Because I, um, one of the things I'll just mention is that nobody used to think about ventilation as being inhumane, but obviously in the context of a respiratory pathogen, it is, um, very different what is a safe or versus an unsafe condition with respect to ventilation. And the standards that, if I, if I showed you the more complete presentation or you can see in our SATF uh, discussion, the standards for what is the ventilation required for a building with infected people in it is very different than what is required for let's say a workplace without infected persons. And so I think that uh, these things will certainly be part of not only considering prison structures going forward, but also what the plan has to be for how you change what happens in a prison when a respiratory pathogen is threatening that prison, because what's safe under normal circumstances is not safe under pandemic circumstances. So in the outside world, we stop going to movie theaters when there's a respiratory pathogen in the community. You don't, you need to plan for decarcerating a, a dorm with 200 men in it if you can't keep a dorm with 200 men in it safe which you can't under these circumstances. So Brie, um, what other more humane things do you think might, might happen? This is a huge question. And uh, I'm very excited to come back another time and talk about our Norway program and non-COVID times. But I'll say this, um, prisons are literally killing everybody who steps foot into them. People who are incarcerated, 
um, have exceptionally poor uh, health, uh, health-related risks and also um, health problems. The things that get most people to prisons, uh, and I would call racism a public health condition. So I would say racism and racial violence um, in the court system, but then other medical problems and health-related problems as well, um, mental health problems, uh, you know, behavioral health problems, a history of trauma, physical health problems, substance use disorders. These things conspire and get people into prisons, keep people in prisons. And then are the number one things that predict people coming back to prisons. So prisons are actually really should be thought of as a healthcare facility, right? We should be thinking of people in prisons as people for whom our public health and behavioral health and mental health services on the outside, we have, we have failed them. And so we have to enhance the services. It has to be beyond the, the community standard. It has to be exceptional. We have to throw services at people who are incarcerated. The way to do that is to decarcerate massively. So we have far fewer people. We're using incarceration as a last resort for people who really need exceptionally high levels of health care and public health brought to them. And then the question is, what else can we do? Because, you know, uh, correctional staff also have an exceptionally poor occupational health uh, profile. They are dying at an average age of 59. So people who are working in prisons, often from the same neighborhoods that people who are incarcerated are coming from, are basically working 30 years in a very sometimes physically demanding job. Um, they retire, they have their party, and they die. And so actually, in one small way, we're actually all on the same side. And the same side is that these facilities have have really let us down. They're exceptionally expensive and they are undermining the health of people who live there, people who work there and our entire communities, neighborhoods and families. And they're a fabric of the United States. We're not gonna be able to improve healthcare in the United States until we address the people who are living and working in our prisons. And so our program AMEND before COVID really has been working to, to do just that. AMEND is sort of a nod to the Eighth Amendment of the United States. Uh, to the United States, which is uh, whatever Bill of Rights, which is essentially saying uh, against cruel and unusual punishment. It's also this idea that we have to mend things that we have done wrong to take stock and fix them. And so really the question is how do we get correctional staff to refuse to do the job that they have been told to do? To, to say we, can, we want a different job, we demand a different job, we demand a job where we're providing services to people and we're linking them to a healthier lifestyle outside of prison and where only the people who absolutely need the services from healthcare, public health, behavioral health, and social health are here. Um, you, have to, you have to tell us okay. both the comparative recidivism rate in Norway and the U.S. and what the motto of their prison system is. I mean, I think that it's hard to compare recidivism rates because there's small differences in the way that people define it. Um, it is much, much lower. Uh, they also incarcerate for far fewer people. But in, in Norway, it really is what we would call a public health model, which is that, you know, people go to prison, they say. People go to court, they say, to get punished. They go to prison to become better neighbors. And that, at its core, is a deeply public health sentiment, is that every policy, every program, every procedure, every interaction that happens in prison is evaluated and assessed with a laser focus on whether or not it helps people to live a better life when they get out. And that's really what we wanna be doing, right? Public safety is about getting people ready to re-enter society in a way that they have all the tools they need to be successful and to be strong members of their community um, and their neighborhoods. That requires not putting people in prison who shouldn't be there. And it requires giving people the tools that they need to get out and live better lives when they're out. And that's really, what we're seeing in Norway, and that's the model that we're trying to bring to the U.S. Thank you, Dr. Williams. And we have a few questions around elders, those who are 55 years and older. There's one person in particular who felt that uh, the first recommendation uh, uh, could have been um, providing a service to uh, 55 and older uh, who have uh, known prior conditions. Um, there was also another question around uh, the issues and the unique issues and experiences, if any, uh, for older adults in prison in the context of COVID and COVID response. 
guess I'll take that as a geriatrician. Um, that's how I got into this work is um, trying to understand and improve the health of older adults who are incarcerated. It's an enormous conversation. Um, what I would say, just like people in the community who are um, at extraordinary risk of poor health outcomes from COVID-19, uh, who are older adults, same is true for older adults inside prisons. Um, the, there are a lot of mechanisms to get people out. And that's just not in California, this is really nationally. There are elder parole programs, there are, um, which are kind of administrative programs. There are compassionate release um, programs. And I think some of what our team has been trying to explain is that compassionate release, which is often um, kind of focused on prognosis, right? Somebody has less than six months to live, for example, that, that prog the prognosis of an older person who is in perfect health, who might have a 10 year life expectancy completely changes in the setting of a respiratory pandemic. And so suddenly they have a very high risk of mortality and their prognosis has actually changed because of the environment that they find themselves living in and the respiratory pathogen that's surrounding them. And so people who would not maybe have qualified for compassionate release should have qualified during this, um, during this, during this period, during this year. What we've seen in the federal system is um, in particular one organization called FAM, Families Against Mandatory Minimums, has done extraordinary work to bring together a toolkit for compassionate release bring together pro bono attorneys who are working together. Um, our team has done a lot of trainings for healthcare professionals who wanna work pro bono on compassionate release cases to link doctors and attorneys together to do this. Um, sometimes nurse practitioners in some states are allowed to file for compassionate release as well, but not in all states. Um, but it has just been, it's a bulky system, it's a slow system, and it's a system that cannot be relied upon in the way that it should be to be able to flex in an emergency situation. So I agree with you. Uh, the number of people age 55 and older who are incarcerated in U.S. prisons is an embarrassment in good times, but during COVID-19 has been an absolute travesty and tragedy um, and the systems have just not been fast enough to respond, although we have seen some success in the federal system. I just mentioned that some good intentioned efforts to decarcerate have focused, for example, on letting people out who are within six months of their expected release date, accelerating the release. What that does though, is it prioritizes people who have short sentences, typically younger people. So rather than helping the people who are most at risk get out, it often is doing the opposite. And in addition, um, the idea that you're not releasing people for concerns about public safety, I can promise you that that 80 year old man with a life sentence who's crossing the yard on his walker doesn't pose a, a safety threat on the outside. Um, so unfortunately, um, people are looking at sentences, they're looking at original crime, not at the statistics of the likelihood that somebody is a threat to society if they're released. And as a result, you see the nursing home kinds of pictures that I showed you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams, Dr. Bertossi, so much. This has been truly a critically important uh, topic and uh, I wish we had more time to, to chat. Um, what I see in the open questions left are two sentiments. One of um, praise for the courage you're doing and also of um, hope that uh, things can change for the better and using COVID as an opportunity for a, a huge reform. And I also see uh, many uh, petitions to uh, contribute and to help in any way we can. So thank you again for making the invisible visible to us and um, hope we can have you back in six months time to check whether we're doing any progress against this um, uh, tremendous condition. So thank you again and um, see you in a couple of uh, weeks for um, the next uh, COVID series. We will announce promptly uh, the topicers uh, in due time. Thank you so much and have a good afternoon. Thank, Thank you, you so Amy, much for having Amy, us. Robert, it's been a pleasure. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.